Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 830. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 14th, 2023. All right, well, thank you for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted, our happy place. We hope this is your happy place, too. Uh, before we get into the show, every once in a while, I want to remind you to like the episode, because that's free advertising on YouTube and uh, Facebook. It shows that you like it, and if you like it, then Facebook will like it, and they'll give it to more people, and more people. It's, it's just free advertising. Go to the comment section. Uh, the last five or six episodes, the comments have just exploded. We need your opinion, your thoughts, uh, occasionally your corrections. Uh, I, apparently I got November 11th all wrong uh, <laughs> in the comment section. And we really appreciate that. That helps keep us honest. And it's encouraging for us to read your comments to know what you're thinking. And if you've not shared this program with friend or foe, it's time. You know, I think that the biggest lack of growth we have is because you're not sharing this on your Facebook feed or uh, sending it to people that uh, you know are interested in the topics we're talking about. So you could really help us out there. We appreciate that. George, it's humid out here in Florida. I mean, putrid humid today. It's cold and humid today. <laughs> I've got a sweater on. Uh, went to a clerg deanery clergy meeting earlier this morning. Uh, we talked about some great stuff. We had some difficult stuff to talk about. We've always we've got a liberal congregation in the diocese, mm -hmm. and it was suggested we're having an initiative on re reaching out to young people and children. And this uh, it was suggested. Well, why don't we have an outreach to gay and lesbian high school students? Well, now, how, how offer, but yes, you should. But to transform them, not to affirm. Yeah. Yes, and uh, however, and uh, I, basically, I, I was the old fart. I said, look, this is contrary to God's word. If, you know, we could ignore what the national church does, but if our local, if we start doing this locally, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have, we would have nothing to do with it because we cannot propound uh, a social doctrine that is contrary to God's word and, word and the revealed truth of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. Uh, but and the, the wonderful thing was all the other people said, oh, thank God you shut it down. But uh, but I guess I guess conservative Episcopalians are so beaten and battered, even in this diocese, from all that's gone back in the years before that we basically hold our tongue. Uh, but when it got too close to home, sorry, we're not going there. We're not following. I, I think it's really sad because uh, as culture has become more aggressive towards those who hold a conservative viewpoint or a biblical viewpoint, uh, us conservatives and Orthodox have shut down and, and stopped responding or stopped saying, oh, we're not going to go there. Uh, we stopped saying no. And in stop saying no, culture has just taken that as a, a yes. I mean, I, I've got a, we have an interfaith uh, ecumenical Thanksgiving uh, service on Thursday at the synagogue. And I've gone to that for ever since I've been here. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to the uh, the congregation's president, and she's telling me about what the head of the Episcopal Church is saying. It's all Israel's fault, you know, that the Episcopal Church uh, tells Israel for a ceasefire. And I, I'm not only apologizing uh, for its theological doctrines, I've now got to deal with our Jewish community, where I'd say, you know, I agree with everything you say that, you know, on this point, but I have to apologize for my presiding bishop and his kookiness uh, on the Israel war. I don't know if they're just not paying attention, but when Hamas puts out a press release, you really shouldn't copy and paste that and put it on your website. You mm -hmm. should investigate and, and in this day and age, let a little time pass. Because lo and behold, uh, a day later after the, the fog of war and first reports have gone through this, you'll find out, okay... I guess Israel didn't nuke Lebanon today. You know, it's like, it, it's really amazing to see what's coming out of uh, the Middle East right now, especially for those who get to watch the IDF films themselves and mm -hmm. see how they've 
retaking the area of the hospital, that they've retaken today the parliament and uh, different parts of Gaza that was controlled by Hamas, how they are, are individually clearing citizens, they're not shooting citizens, they're evacuating them from the, the, the area. And this is video you can see on Twitter. Uh, the most amazing video I see uh, is all the people who are finally admitting that they got phone calls before their bombing was, their building was bombed. Uh, and the BBC is actually interviewing these people who lived in the Gaza Strip and eight or ten hours before the, their building, which held Hamas, was bombed, they were told by the IDF to evacuate. I saw on TV the other night uh, Schindler's List, uh, oh, and that's, that's there was that one scene where the SS is cleaning out the ghetto, and you have the SS stormtroopers delighting in savagery delighting in savagery and then when the movie's over i turn on the news and i see these uh, body cams taken from dead hamas soldiers uh who are delighting in their savagery that you, you know uh, there's an old saw that if you have to if you bring up hitler and nazi illusions you've lost the argument because nothing could be that bad yes something is that bad and that's uh, that this attack on the civilians in Israel by the Hamas terrorists who were rejoicing in killing and maiming and raping and burning alive and doing all these horrible things that that took place last month. It's what a world we live in, Kevin, where this is this has come back. And it's stranger this time. It, we've had those evils in the past. Okay, uh, man has been evil towards man for thousands of years, no, no doubt about it. It's worse now because we see it in almost real time. And mm -hmm. we see the celebrations of the evil in real time. Uh, we didn't see that when we, we finally uh, got back the concentration camps. It took us a, a little while to figure out what was happening here. Um, we, we didn't understand this, the, the pile of bodies and, and the smell of uh, crematories. We, it, it took a little while to figure out what was happening uh, to the Jewish population in Germany and Poland and uh, around there. We, nobody would do that. But no, and now we get to see it thank, real time. Thank goodness for Dwight D. Eisenhower, who required the press to go in and film these things. Because yeah. otherwise, no one would have believed it. No one would have believed it if we just had these rumors of soldiers coming back. But Eisenhower directed the uh, press to go visit Belsen and Bergen, and Belsen Bergen, uh, which was the one of the camps the Americans and the British liberated, and see for themselves the piles of bodies, because otherwise it would be unbelievable. And as and, I watch and, the news now, it is unbelievable to see what's happening now. So. And, and yeah. you have people, oh, who's the guitarist for Pink Floyd? Uh, Waters, I forget his first name. David? Is saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever, he's uh, he's uh, a longtime uh, hostile to Israel saying, well, I don't believe these atrocities took place. I, You know, it's not credible that these things, because why would they do that? Because it would only make the world hate them even more. And if these body cam photos had not been captured, if Hamas had not decided to put this stuff out on social media for the world to see, I mean, to me, one of the most horrific is where they have this video of a, a young man uh, calling his parents to tell them he's just killed 10 Jews. And his parents rejoice with him in his, uh, in his victory. I mean, we're talking sick here. And this isn't something that happened overnight. This this is a boiling point of, you know, 50, 60, 70 years of the, of the Middle East and this confrontation. You know, we're not pretending that this woke up overnight. Okay, the, the Middle East con confrontations happened for thousands of years, but this latest boiling point has been uh, behesting us for at least 30 or 40, 50 years. And it's hard to watch, George. And at the same time, Amer America, people, Americans in the West, Canadians are getting dumber and dumber and dumber, meaning lack of information. I saw a statistic where 57% of college students in the United States did not know what the Holocaust was. And, that, and how you see that play out is where we have people in Canada saying, oh, it was a genocide against Native, Native Canadian children in these residential schools. 
no, there are no bodies. There are no mass graves. It's all been a big hoo-ha. It was not a nice place, but it wasn't the deliberate systematic murder of a people no. that what we saw last month in Israel and 75, 80 years ago in Europe. Go on any college campus here in North America, ask if they know what the final solution is. What was the final solution? And they couldn't tell you. And if you mm -hmm. told them what it was, they wouldn't believe you. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody would do that. And I think we've, we've lost that uh, international perspective of history. And uh, the famous quote is, uh, history repeats itself. Well, we're, we're doing that now. And I know, again, we'll do it again in the future because I'm watching just the the lack of knowledge on our uh, campuses. Watch what the students do on campus, and you know it's the opposite of what you should do. Yeah. But, hey, we need to move on because you know what's happening today, George? General Synod, where they're going to discuss and likely push forward, uh, at least one man will, LLF, Living Love and Faith, uh, which has been discussed now for two years by uh, different factions, mostly the bishops and then uh, the church. So let's talk about now. What's happening, George? Well, as we are filming this, the debate on LLF is is taking place in a General Synod meeting in the in London at the church house. Um, yesterday was the first day of Synod, and most of it was taken up by questions. And and the two introductory speeches by the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. And both of them, I think, did something rather surprising in the sense that they they basically stated outright what they wanted Synod to do on the LLF. They want Synod to approve it but now. LLF, gay blessings now. Not three years after its study, not any sort of things. They want it now. They don't want gay marriage, they want gay blessings. And all of the theological arguments, the political arguments, none of that makes any sense. It, it makes any difference to their to the thinking. And the questions, several questions uh, were put forward by many conservative evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics asking for details of how this worked, how, you know, what's the theology, what's this, what's that, what's that. And one of the questions was, well, if General Synod votes down LLF. Can the Archbishop of Canterbury and York go ahead and bring these prayers in anyway? And the Bishop of London said, yes, they can. So there's oh, almost oh, a oh, sense. Oh, oh, hold on. What is the point of General Synod if you can just be overruled by the Archbishop? Well, technically, they would say, well, the Archbishop is just putting in a trial and it would be up to another General Synod to evaluate this trial, this and that. But Kevin, at the end of the day, you're right. Welby is bulldozing this thing through. He's trying to use almost, he, he's creating papal authority here uh, to uh, force the issue. Now, uh, Jane Ozan uh, over the weekend wrote an editorial saying Welby must go. We had uh, Lee Gaddis from the Church Society telling Welby to his face, he must go. Sam Margrave, friend of this show, a member of General Synod from Coventry Diocese, brought forward a petition at the beginning of Synod asking uh, that Welby be asking the king to ask Welby to resign because of Welby's failure over safeguarding, you know, the John Smythe and uh, uh, Jonathan Fletcher business. And, uh, well, that petition was taken under advisement and passed to the bus business committee, meaning it's going to be strangled and not see the light of day. So Welby is getting hammered from left and right, and he is trying to, through political muscle alone to get gay blessings in. Not gay marriage, which is what the activists want. Not uh, a once and done which is what they want. Colin Coward, another friend of this show, but on the liberal side, attended the debates yesterday and said, you know, look, I'm just so mad and so angry. You know, the other side isn't moving an inch in their opposition. It's time we just broke and went forward and have one church for them and one church for us. 
uh, no, which hold is on. There, been held by conservatives. There's truth to that because here in the Episcopal Church, they kept giving little inches. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, since the 1962 uh, and on, uh, just okay, whatever, just don't bother us. You know that that was the thing. It's happening in that diocese over there. It doesn't bother me here. And at some point, okay, well, we have to have a trial for writer and all this. But other than that, just don't bother us. And they kept allowing this little bit of um, give back and uh, all the time. They never did, didn't do much pushback. But they said, okay, yeah, whatever. Just do it in your diocese. Keep it out of mine. And what happened, George? <laughs> the mess that you see today. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we see, you know, a Bishop Bill Love being forced out mm-hmm. of the church, but for standing for the, the clear, unchanging word of God, for the traditions of the church, uh, for standing against culture. He's kicked out of the Episcopacy, and now Albany has a pro-gay bishop and will soon uh, be indistinguishable from central New York. Yeah both in its collapsing attendance and in its doctrine and discipline. Now, I, we have many viewers from Albany, and I don't wish that upon them. No. You know, God can do wonderful things, but if we listen to what his plans are, listen and listen, uh, finding unity in our diversity. The strength of the Episcopal Church is its diversity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the strength between of, believers and non-believers. You know, yes. we, we were strengthened by that. Yeah, the, the strength of the church is the gospel. Okay, the strength. But see, Kevin. Of, yeah. Now it's a great time to be an evangelical. Do you know why? Because you see the utter depravity of human beings right before you in church, church leaders. <sighs> on well, totally yeah. bananas well they have i mean we have entered the age where i would call the you know the episcopal church apostate uh Rowan, uh the church of england apostate you know for even entertaining these ideas of not allowing the gospel to be transformative even though we have witnesses throughout the age who have gone and suffered through all of these things who have been transformed whether it be attraction to same sex, whether it be uh, um, disease, whether it be sin, they have been transformed out of that into a life of righteousness. And uh, we have a church here that wants to, at the end of the day, just argue politics. And hey, why don't I, as the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, and I, as the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, tweet about Israel? That's what no <laughs> go go save the souls uh, oh but now i have been in touch with um, some conservatives traditionalists uh, attending senate observing senate they don't feel defeated okay. they know they've got the numbers to block uh llf and their thinking is that if welby tries to push this on his own this is where the nicky gumbel threat of bringing the lawyers in one of the questions asked uh, at General Synod is, have you been sued yet? And the qu- response was, well, people have made their intentions known to us, but no, we've not been sued yet. Well, the suit would come because it's likely LLF will fail on votes because it doesn't have two thirds margins. It'll come if Welby acts unilaterally because then he'll be by his own personal fiat trying to change the doctrine which he cannot do so there's still room here for lawyers to make money folks if you, if you want to root for the real heroes or the bad guys <laughs> depending upon your point of view uh, all right let's let's uh, go further overseas mozambique bishops demand that the anglican primate be removed hmm I- this is a, what I would call an Anglican Inc. special. We're the only people who come up with this. You will not see this on the Anglican Communion News Service anywhere else. Uh, Ten of the twelve bishops of Mozambique and Angola, the newest province of the Anglican Communion, wrote a public letter demanding the resignation of the primate, Carlos Mazzini. And the reason why is that Archbishop Mazzini, who is the Bishop of Lebombo, which is uh, the area around the capital city of Maputo on the border of South Africa, 
He is the head of the National Election Commission. And there was an election last month that was dodgy, where the ruling party mysteriously took control of uh, 64 out of 65 town councils, shutting out the opposition completely, uh, and with only one town going to a third party. And there were all sorts of uh, documented cases of voter fraud. Human Rights Watch has been all over this. And the bishops wrote to the archbishop saying, the National Election Commission needs to investigate, needs to straighten this out because we've got real voter fraud here. And the archbishop said, no, 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 no. And then they, his team certified the elections. Well, in response, uh, 10 of the 12 bishops have called for his resignations. And today, not only is General Synod meeting, but the bishops of Mozambique are meeting and there's one item on their agenda, and that's the resignation of the Archbishop. We'll see what happens. But well, watch. actually, there are yeah. wheels within wheels here. All right. Uh, when the province was, the, the current Archbishop is a caretaker Archbishop. In yeah. other words, he can't serve a full term because of his age. And when uh, Anthony Pogo, the Anglican Consultative Council's General Secretary, came down to help open the new province, he lobbied the bishops, so that I am told by one of the bishops in Mozambique, that uh, Bishop Ernesto should be the successor. Well, Bishop Ernesto is the other bishop who didn't sign. So you have the Archbishop and Bishop Ernesto not signing the call for the Archbishop to resign. And because uh, Carlos and Ernesto are Welbyites. They want to keep Mozambique in the Welby fold, good citizens and this and that. The other 10 bishops are GAFCON Global South people. Now, once the archbishop is voted out of office and the new archbishop is elected, he'll come from that 10 who are pro-GAFCON, pro-Global pro South, which means Mozambique and Angola will move firmly into the Global South GAFCON camp means there'll be new outreach to the Anglican Church in Brazil, led by Archbishop uh, 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 Uchoa. Uh, they'll be dropping the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil as a partner. In other words, this is a significant day. In other words, we're going to see uh, some real shifting in the alliances and allegiances across the communion. Well, we were talking pre-show, and you mentioned that uh, there's more to Ben Quashi's retire, retire, retirement than meets the eye, and it's kind of a reboot for GAFCON, and I thought we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, Paul, Paul Donaldson is the new general secretary, and Laurent, Laurent Mabamba is the new president. Mabamba was elected at the Kigali Conference in succession mm -hmm. to Archbishop Foley Beach, and it was announced that... Um, Ben Kwashi has stepped down as Archbishop Emeritus on the church in Nigeria. And then at the GAFCON uh, primates meeting was announced that Paul Donison, the, the Dean of uh, Christ Church in Plano, the, uh, at the pro cathedral, pro cathedral there yeah. is going to be the new general secretary. Well, uh, after basically reprinting the GAFCON announcement, I listened and talked to people. And evidently there was a push to get rid of Ben Kwashi. Ben's been ill for a while with uh, colon cancer. and Which I think he's in remission now. If I he's in remission that. now. Yeah. But GAFCON really has not, in some people's views, lived up to its potential. And it was felt by some people that, okay, Ben's had a good run, but we need to have new blood, younger blood. And uh, we'll pick somebody who... Uh, who can sort of carry it forward at this time. And, you know, one of the first acts is replacing the head of the Bishop's Training Program in GAFCON. Um, had <clears throat> Ben Kwashi had replaced Sam Samson Maluda of uh, Kenya, had been the head. Ben Kwashi got rid of him, put in a Nigerian. And now, and that really wasn't real well received in some parts, and now... Uh, the new head of the bishop's training program is going to be Archbishop Henry Aramba of, Harambi of Uganda. Hey, I haven't heard that Kevin name for a while. Know. Good, yeah. yeah. And who is a real wonderful fellow. And 
so we're this is an opinion now the not a fact that i can prove or demonstrate but we seem to be de nigeriaizing the upper levels that, of that's fair GAFCON. that's fair yeah I, and i think what you're looking here is between gafcon 3 and gafcon 4 we saw that gafcon itself had an identity crisis you know who are we what are we doing that we you know, all this potential in this little package and they didn't really they were kind of utter, utterless rut, utterless rutterless george Oh, no, oh my goodness! Now, this is not to say that Ben Quashi didn't do an excellent job. He did no, an he's excellent, a, job. excellent job. Yeah, but there does come a time when you need somebody to pass the baton forward, um, and the Gafcon leadership evidently felt now is the time. All right, let's move on to our next story. It's going to involve presiding Bishop Michael Curry, and I just can I just add this to his title: the apostate. Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. It's one more title there. I added one more word uh, to describe with a good adjective what's going on. Um, they are, I don't want to say anti-Semitic, but they're certainly posting some uh, press releases from Hamas on websites and Twitter accounts there, George. There's an American saying, and it might be a British saying, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, once burned, twice shy. Meaning, uh, if you loudly trump uh trumpet news that later turns out to be false you'll later be shy in repeating news from that same source without checking it well uh welby and curry were caught out by the uh, uh anglican hospital bombing and uncritically repeated the claim by the hamas uh, ministry of health that 500 people were killed in an israeli bombing attack on the hospital now that has been shown not to be true the it, missile itself was a um uh an errant it was friendly fire is what we call it. friendly fire hamas yeah. missile and the actual death toll it didn't hit the hospital it hit the parking lot and it killed people in the parking lot and the death toll was anywhere from 20 to 50. it's still terrible that people died but it was not a uh a deliberate attacking targeting of a hospital that killed 500 people uh, by the Israelis. Now, both Michael Curry and uh, on Saturday, Justin Welby put out statements uh, saying that 10,000 civilians in Gaza have died. Well, the only people that comes from the, the, the Hamas Ministry of Health, the same people told, who told us that 500 have died. So if you want to take the correct ratios, you have to divide that by 10. So maybe a thousand civilians have died if you want to work with the ratios. And both Welby and uh, Curry have said we need to have a ceasefire. And we and more Welby said it's morally unjustifiable to attack hospitals, even if Hamas is using them as military installations. Well, the rules, international law and the rules of war are quite clear. If you use a civilian structure, a school, a hospital as a military base, then that is a fair target. And if there are civilian casualties, the responsibility lies with the people who turned it into a military target. So if any civilians are being killed in the siege of hospitals in Gaza, it's the, it's the Hamas's fault and responsibility. Well, now let, let's back up a little bit here because we're talking about hostage situation. Yes, uh, Hamas has taken hundreds of Israeli citizens hostage. They're also holding hostage the patients in the hospital. You can't leave without being hit by a sniper. Yes, the the Israelis... Uh, see, And why are these hospitals even targeted? Because the billions of dollars sent by the West and Europe and even Israel to build infrastructure in Gaza has not been used to build roads and schools and water supplies and whatnot. It's been used to enrich <clears throat> the leaders of Hamas, the individual leaders who live in Qatar, each billionaires many times over, courtesy of the United States taxpayer. And underneath the hospitals are the military installations, the headquarters, the structures that Hamas operates the war from. It's their Pentagon, and they've deliberately cited under civilian targets. Now, 
Israel has surrounded some one hospital and they've asked, they've urged the people to leave and the civilians try to leave and Hamas shoots them as they leave. Um, Israel has provided fuel for some of the generators for these hospitals. And if they people try to pick it up to run the generators, to run the electricity for the necessary services, Hamas shoots at those picking up the, the diesel fuel. And <clears throat> this misinformation that we're getting from Justin Welby and actually moral shallowness I think I won't say idiocy, but I'll say no, shallowness. I mean, he hasn't, he uh, hasn't he, thought it through. Is just indicative of somebody who's just listening to Hamas people without critical thinking. Now, maybe he, Justin Welby's excuse is that he listens to the BBC, and the BBC has been repeating Hamas uh, propaganda. Um, but for goodness sake, I mean, the Western reporters were embedded with the Gazan forces as they went into Israel to conduct the massacres. And you were wondering uh, why the news we're getting from Gaza is false? Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, I'm just going to pull out my other story here so you people see this one. And I can't believe the BBC, of all people, uh, published this, but once in a while they get it right. I'm going to Pull it up here, put it in my list, and boom. Uh, the BBC has been interviewing these people now uh, who have been contacted by Israel Intelligence who says, uh, we're about to bomb the building. Uh, we have your cell phone number. Leave and take as many people out of the building as possible. And mm. it talks about this conversation this guy had with Israel Intelligence. And mm -hmm. I'm going to put a link to this in the show notes. But, you know, finally, a little bit of the story is coming clear uh, in the BBC of all places. So, hey, Justin, can I, I have your email. I'm going to send you this story, okay, just so you can uh, keep up with what's happening in the world. And No. Yeah? Uh, do, do Kevin and I support the death of innocent civilians in a war? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. We we want we wish peace to, we wish the peace of jerusalem upon all the participants our our criticisms are for people who are going half half cocked and making moral judgments about a war where we don't know all the facts which we're because we're watching it in real time you know for the mm -hmm. first time in history uh we have as much social media on the ground uh a thou a million cameras everybody has a cell phone and we're not able to interpret what we're seeing. We're being told uh, and misinformed very quickly about what we're seeing. Uh, I remember all the images on CNN and MSNBC about this bombing of a hospital. And when the smoke cleared from the parking lot, the hospital remained. And at no point did anybody from MSNBC or CNN say, oh, it doesn't look like the hospital was bombed. What happened? Nobody said that. They kept the narrative. And to this day, if you ask anybody uh, in the head office at CNN, they will tell you, of course, Israel bombed the Anglican hospital in Gaza Strip. I think it was NBC. I, I may have the network wrong. One of the American networks had a little story saying that, uh, listen, Israel is machine gunning people trying to leave the hospital. Well, and you can hear the sounds of automatic right. gunfire. Well, the problem is, as uh, somebody pointed out, uh, that Israel uses uh, a different caliber type of machine gun. And the sounds you were hearing were those that are uh, unique to an AK-47, which Israel does not use. They use a 5.65 chambered caliber uh, round. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, MS, uh, NBC's, you know, machine gun fire, it's being fired at Gazan civilians. Therefore, it must be from Israel when those who actually know a bit about, you know, military can tell you whether that's not an Israeli weapon being fired. It's a it's a Russian weapon. And that's what got the Hamas uses. And that's the sort of thing that we're talking about where people make these claims. It's Israel firing just because that's my prejudice is what I think it'll be rather than stopping and trying to evaluate what you have in front of you. 
Well, we've covered that story enough. Let's move on to some more stuff here. I have, uh, let's talk about uh, Bishop Ann Dyer. She's from the Diocese of Aberdeen. And finally, after all the complaints you and I have been hearing now for uh, 18 months, two years, she's going to be disciplined. But how do we get here where finally this is happening, George? Last week, the uh, Scottish Episcopal Church announced that the... Uh, uh, Bishop Ann Dyer, the Bishop of Aberdeen and Orkney, would be brought to the, uh, her case would be investigated by the prolocutor of the Scottish Episcopal Church, the chief legal officer. Ann Dyer in 2022 was suspended for on allegations of bullying and abuse, just being a horrid person to her clergy. And Ann Dyer's response was, well, they're just being mean to me because I'm a woman and I'm pro-gay marriage. Well, an investigation was carried out, two investigations were carried out, but one was by a man named Professor Ian Torrance, who was a Presbyterian Church of Scotland, so he's an outsider. And he did a, an investigation and he concluded that there is no way she can continue in office because she's burned every single bridge and she's a bit of a bully. And not a bit of a bully, she's a bully. And he unearthed the fact that her last job as warden of Cramner Hall, a seminary at, I think, Durham University, she had quit. She had resigned after allegations of bullying were raised against her. Well, this Torrance report was given to the Scottish bishops who, true to the Episcopal name, decided to fudge. They said, well, we won't fire her or suspend her. Let's see if we can have mediation and reconciliation, which meant she tried to get rid of all her enemies. <laughs> and so after more complaints were filed and the reconciliation failed, the Scottish bishops threw up their hands and said, okay, this now is gonna proceed down the canonical path to trial. And we're handing it over to the church attorney to make his investigations and recommendations. And they're only, the recommendations are, turn it over to the police if it's a criminal matter, find her not guilty or proceed and put her on trial for the things that she's accused of. And it's not a police matter. Enough has been done in the Torrance report to show that there is substance to this. So she's gonna go, I'm assuming she's gonna go to trial and uh, will be removed from office. She's the first woman bishop in the Scottish Bishopal Church and her support and the House of Bishops has basically rested on that, that essentially they don't want to be shown, because she was appointed to that job. She wasn't elected. And I think the Mark Strange, the Primus, that was that was his doing. Yep. And I, doesn't, I don't think he wants to look like an idiot by having his hand-picked person kicked out for being a total incompetent. I mean, the first stories we heard about, you know, the driver issue, she had every, this, this is the issue we had the driver, right? Yeah, she yeah, can't drive a car, and she has a rural diocese. Yeah, and uh, uh, something with the, the bell ringers. I mean, we've heard so many different issues that uh, they're beyond strange, but they are what you would say, yeah, that that is, if true, bullying, you know, so. At a small little thing, Dorsey McConnell, the former Episcopal Bishop of Pittsburgh, uh, is who's retired, uh, he has been living in there, sort of on an extended vacation. He's been at, appointed as the uh, interim acting bishop to take care of the Episcopal needs until uh, this is resolved and they either return Bishop Dyer to office or they elect a new bishop. Okay. So let's move on to some other news stories. Early on when, uh, this is 2004, 5, 6, 7, when the Episcopal Church was being... Oh, my favorite word today, apostate. Uh, the ACN and was growing as a network here in America. And churches were like, you know, we don't see a way forward with the Episcopal Church. What should we do to save our resources for a battle down the road or for a new church you know, we're going to plant or something like that? And it was suggested that you set aside your money and have your congregation uh, put that money into a separate savings account that can't be touched by uh, the bishop or uh, anybody and to let it grow. And then one day, this is money you would have given the bishop, one day uh, you can use that money as a plant or to fight a court battle or do what you need to do. But whatever you do, don't give that money to the head office. 
They don't deserve. They don't deserve it anymore. This has been a a little bit of what's been happening in the Church of England now for a, a year or two. Uh, diocese have uh, or churches have taken money that they were going to give to the diocese and have held it in reserve. And now we have rumors it's starting to hurt, George. From the jaws of victory, conservatives can always snatch defeat. They can. <laughs> <laughs> now, the financial situation of the Church of England is different from the Episcopal Church. Some Episcopal dioceses, like New York or Los Angeles, have so much money that it doesn't matter whether you give it to them or not. They're still there. Central Florida, for instance, lives on its income. It doesn't have any inherited wealth because, you know, Florida is relatively... New diocese has only been around since the 1970s. Yeah. Well, several... Di several uh, Dioceses have, in England have seen the creation of what they call, they call good stewards trusts. In England, you are not required to send your contribution to the diocese the way you are in most Episcopal churches. My diocese, I'm required to kick 10% 10, 10 upstairs. Uh, I sort of view it as, you know, uh, the, you know, being shaken down by the mafia because, you know, I got to send it no matter what. And if I don't, there are consequences. So, so nice church you have here. Be ashamed if something happened to it. it some broke a window or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or broke it, or I'm missing a kneecap or two. Well, the Church of England, uh, you don't have to do that. And it's, there's an asking. And the money has been placed in by, meant by a good number of evangelical parishes into these good stewards' trusts. And I believe in London, for instance, we've seen a half million dollar, half million pounds, is the latest figure I heard, diverted from diocesan treasury into these good stewards trust, where the trustees then use it to support ministry the way a diocese would, but without all the uh, advisors and women's advisors, and minority affairs advisors, and the bishop chauffeur, and all this and that, rather than going supporting other like-minded uh, poor congregations. Well, Rob Monroe, who is the Bishop of Ebbsfleet, and I like him. He's a nice guy. First you of all, big. Are you, I met him in Kigali. Yeah. I met him in Kigali. He's a big guy, too. He's about my size in many ways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> height and girth. And I think he's been got at because he put out a letter last week saying, we evangelicals need to reconsider are redirected giving and start giving back to the diocese because you know they do do good things with the money and i'm thinking the only reason why he put this letter out is it's really pinching some places he, he got talked to by the people upstairs <laughs> he i don't know this but i'm assuming that he got sat on hard saying if you want any sort of evangelical victory over here you guys got to cough up the cash Otherwise, we'll make your life or your people's lives miserable. Now, already in the Diocese of Oxford, for instance, I know one uh, conservative evangelical parish whose curate has moved on to a new church, and Bishop Stephen Croft will not license a new curate unless they restart the, uh, the money, the cash flow. Now, the parish does need the money from the diocese to pay for the curate. They've got it already, but they need a licensed curate, and only the bishop can do that. Now, because the diocese in the Church of England, it's not where the money is. The money is with the church commissioners, the national church. So that, uh, uh, you know, London may be a wealthy diocese, but the real money is held higher up the chain by the church commissioners. Yeah. But I, I do think that uh, if it's a sign that this withholding is effective and working, that it's causing... Because Rob Monroe is not dumb and he's not weak. He's not, and he's not a go along, get along guy. But I think it's been made quite clear to him. And again, I don't know this, but I think it's been made quite clear that if you want something out of this crack up, you, this is the price we're going to demand of you. Yeah. Money. It's all about money. Hey, I don't like to talk about splits in the church, but uh, apparently the province of Central Africa. Zambia, that's Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi will split into national churches and hold out the promise that your diocese uh, in this split can choose 
whether or not you recognize women's orders, George. Yes, the Church of the Province of Central Africa is one of the few provinces that does not have women clergy, and they're divided in this province. There are some parish dioceses that, no, it's not going to happen, never going to happen, for theological and cultural reasons. Others that are more westernized are saying, yes, we can't wait to, for it to happen, Botswana being an example. And they've long wanted to go their different ways, the different national churches. And in fact, they have the Zimbabwe Anglican Council, the Malawi Anglican Council. They really only do stuff nationally, except when they get together for synod meetings. So now they've decided they're going to split because they've developed enough that where they have enough money to support three structures and Botswana will probably be kicked over into South Africa, which it is closer in tuned with. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason why it's in Central Africa is that you didn't want to put Botswana in South Africa during the apartheid era. Uh, so, so the the net result of this, politically speaking, is that we'll get one Gafcon province, one Canterbury province, and one province for sale. Malawi is a firm Global South Gafcon yes. province. Yeah, Always has been. Mm -hmm. Zambia, under its current Archbishop Albert Chama, the Bishop of Lusaka, is somebody who is happy to take Welby's money and parrot his words on the international stage but be very conservative at home. At home, he's very conservative, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And Zimbabwe, unfortunately, has a reputation for being for sale to the highest bidder. Not just uh, in the church, <laughs> but you know, economically, politically, uh, Zimbabwe is one of those very troubled countries. It may always be, you know. Well, it, I've been there a number of times. I haven't been there in 20 years, but... Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a tragedy what's happened in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. with the uh, with the government first of Robert Mugabe and now the current president just driving it to poverty and and this is where Nolbert Kanunga was the uh, Mugabe bishop of Harare and Eric Rwana I think the bishop of uh, Masvani uh, is the one who is under uh, police indictment for corruption it's uh, some some areas are more prone to corruption than other areas, and Zimbabwe is one of them. Church corruption and political corruption. All right, hey, the AC went on, George. It's not like it's, uh, it's probably just fighting the humidity out there. It also started to rain if you're listening closely. Uh, so as we're talking about Africa, we're hearing rumors of stuff we've talked about for years now. Uh, the, the quote I have here is, demonic gay agenda is being imposed on us here in African countries, George. Yeah, this is interesting because we have three archbishops from three very different provinces essentially say the same thing. Uh, Henry Edekuba at the uh, speech to the Divine uh, Commonwealth, DivCon, Divine Commonwealth Conference in Abuja, made the statement that the uh, Western nations and Western churches are seeking to indoctrinate uh, Nigeria with gay ideology. The whole transgender cult, the same-sex marriage cult, the death of the family, uh, that is the price that uh, Africans must pay if they're going to take money, either government money or church money from the West. And, and de Cuba says that's demonic. Well, I think most of you who know follow church politics would say, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Because they're Nigerians. Well, coincidentally, the Archbishop of Ghana, uh, Archbishop Ben Smith, his last name is hyphen Ben Smith. It's not Benjamin Smith, but he said the same thing to his own church, where Ghana is being told that it must, by the EU and Britain and the United States and Western aid givers, and Western churches with whom they're aligned, that they must change their laws and culture and teaching on human sexuality, on the family, to mimic that of the West. Otherwise, the spigot gets turned off. And the Archbishop of Ghana, Ben Smith, is saying, that's unacceptable. You know, that is contrary to God's word revealed. That is contrary to our cultures and traditions. This is the rankest form of colonialism where you are basically dictating to us poor little people in Africa 
what the smart people in England and New York think. And then you have uh, Jackson Ole Sapit, the Archbishop of Kenya, saying the same thing there. In all in response to, it wasn't that they all stated this simultaneously, but all in response to particular initiatives in their own countries, where either government agencies or NGOs or the World Health Organization or churches are saying, if you want this, you must do that. And all three are basically saying, we are not having it. A few weeks ago, we reported on how the uh, Archbishop of Uganda welcomed the uh, Ayatollah, Wherever, whoever the Ayatollah is now in Iran, and one of the and how Uganda is thinking about joining BRICS, the uh, Russia, China, South Africa, India, you know, the anti-European American power group, and it's not because all of a sudden the Uganda wants to be Shiite Muslims or because they want uh, uh, Russian. Uh, Rus Russians to replace Americans and English in their cities. Rather, they just have had enough of being jerked around by the West and being told that they're ignorant, that they're stupid, that uh, this is the way the smart people are going to do it. And it, it general. Let's get back to General Senate. It, it, it give you an example. In one of the uh, in Welby's speech, and in some of the questions and answers. Uh, well be said that I appreciate that uh, if we go forward with gay blessings, this will, Africans, Christians may pay a price. Mm -hmm. But then they, yeah. but even then they would their, e Even with their lives. It's not just, you know. Even with, yeah. But we cannot be bullied by threats of violence against doing the right thing. So first off, well be saying doing the right thing is the gay blessings. Second, that the real target of this bullying are not African Christians, but uh, the English Synod, and English Synod is not going to be uh, told what to do by Africans. And if people get killed in Africa, well, we're sorry, but our scruples require us to do what we're doing. So, so it doesn't how, work both ways, yeah, you know. How bad is the West that your only good choice to have moral character for your country is to look towards Russia, to look towards China and Venezuela and other Marxist countries. I mean, how bad has the West lost its battle with gender and uh, uh, queer community and all this that China looks palatable? It's part of the madness that we see in the world today where you see groups called uh, Queers for Palestine marching now if the queers for palestine happen to march in Ram ramallah or uh or uh nablus they'd be murdered uh maybe the iranians would toss them off the top of higher buildings uh which what they do to gays in iran but they would still be killed by hamas or hezbollah because of their violent opposition to the gay gen to homosexuality yeah. yet we see gay activists in the United States and in Britain, leftists joining joining arms with Iranian. Um, I've seen this. Uh, I've seen this called a black red alliance, where the far left and the militant Islam, though they have nothing in common except for the desire for power, are linking arms against Western civilization. <laughs> We live in this kind of weird uh, time. I, I I just lost what I was going to say about this, uh, but Hamas and Hezbollah are doing exactly what the West, uh, liberals have been accusing the Christians of doing. Okay, mm -hmm. they accuse us of hating and wanting to kill uh, the gays and having homophobia, transophobia, uh, whatever phobia. In reality, the people they support the very most. This week, believe that. Now, not all Islam. I, I don't want to, I'm not putting this all in one uh, thing, but certainly uh, the violent Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, um, there are factions of Islam who have determined that the best course forward for a person 
who is gay is death. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's guaranteed in their laws that you will die. We don't have that anywhere in Christendom. You know? We, we've not talked about things that our view, English viewers today, apart from Synod, would think would be pressing, but, you know, the marches over this past week and Remembrance Sunday, Remembrance Day, the uh, dismissal of the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, um, and the withdrawal of life support from the little baby girl, Indy, I forget her last name, by the government, saying, we'd rather her die than go to Italy for life-saving treatment. Um, there's just... I hate to say this, but, you know, the Babylon Bee, which is an American satirical newspaper, said, uh, you know, 70 years later, the Nazis finally have conquered London. Uh, and hey. just look at this past weekend. Yeah. Because, you know, we've got the, the, the murder of infants uh, who are not, uh, whose lives are not worth living. We have, uh, fa you know, Islamo-fascists marching down the street, calling for, a you know, death to the Jews. Uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning ethnically cleanse and kill Israeli settlers. We've got the government having the police arrest counter demonstrations of portly Englishmen who look like you and me, Kevin, for saying we want Britain to be Britain. They get arrested and beaten up uh, in their hunt, you know, while the uh, pro Hamas, pro Palestine people are given free reign to cause ha ha havoc and panic in the streets. And then when you have a government minister who finally says enough is enough, the BBC mounts a campaign to get rid of her. Now, I don't want to talk about Tory politics. It's way beyond my knowledge base. Yeah. There may be wheels within wheels within wheels. But uh, my goodness me, uh, when we see David Cameron back in power, next thing I know, and it it's been suggested that Tony Blair be the mediator between the Arabs and the Muslims in Israel in Gaza. Uh, is that chest pain? I feel I, I, Oh, my whole left hand is numb. It's like, what? <laughs> I almost feel like, and again, we Americans, we cannot throw stones because look at our government, look at our government, but man, oh man. Oh, uh, ours are, okay. Love him or hate him. Trump is part kook. Love him or hate him. Biden is, a lot of kook. This Robert Jr. guy, Robert Kennedy Jr., who's uh, independent now, part kook. We, we don't have a really, really solid choice. We're going to get one of the three, I think. But, we, we, you know, uh, another kook is our president. Uh, it's been the last 30 years anyway. So, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, George, we have hit uh, almost an hour here. We have. Let me double Kevin, check. Does so that stories. mean we don't we don't have the time for the Indian corruption story? Oh, it, yeah. we covered so much corruption. Oh no no no, that that Roman Catholic bishop who got fired oh, for yes. being too Catholic. I do that. Um, so report uh, the the Roman Catholic conservative semi orthodox world is mad at the Pope again, George. If you want the straight story, check out Gavin Ashenden's posts on yeah. this. He a uh, great friend of this show, former mm -hmm. uh, former. Uh, he had his own chair yeah, for yeah. co-host. Co former co-host, yes. Yeah. Joseph Strickland is the Bishop of Tyler, Texas. Tyler is in sort of East Texas. This is pointy boot and uh, skinny white cowboy hat territory. And he's been a very harsh critic of uh, Pope Francis. He is, and the, sometimes the, there's an old joke in America, is the Pope Catholic, meaning, of course, something is true. Well, potentially, Bishop Strickland is saying the Pope isn't Catholic. And he has been complaining about the Pope from a traditionalist perspective, some of the Pope's statements on you know, the gay issue and this and that and the other. Well, an investigation was held by uh, an, a bishop and a cardinal, and they came back and said uh, unspecified problems within the diocese, so he is being removed administratively. He's not being disciplined. He's just being reassigned to other duties. Uh, he's he's going to paint the door. Uh, he's, going, he's, he's going to be picking up trash on the highway. And the, the interesting thing is, is the pushback this is received of, by lay Catholics and Catholic conservative clergy around the world. That, you know, you've got this German bishop, uh, uh, Bishop uh, Karl Heinz Weismann in uh, Speer, who's saying, oh, yeah, we're going to start blessing gay blessings. Nothing against him. Nothing at all against him. 
But uh, when Bishop Strickland says, you know, this is what the magisterium, the unchanging teaching of the church says on this point, and Francis doesn't have the ability to change it, boom, out he goes. So there's a Strickland, uh, I think, uh, has been called the, the Catholic Church's, the American Church's Athanasius, meaning the bishop who will stand for what is right against the other bishops who are being led astray by false teaching. And, uh, or you could call him the Bill Love of the, Ang of the Catholic world. <laughs> for doing what was right, he gets hammered. Well, I would call Pope Francis the Biden of uh, the, the Roman Catholic world because he's 86 now, right? 85, 86? Yeah, maybe not everything's uh, working up in the faculties. Uh, w when dad took up to 81, 82, we took away the TV remote. Mom's like, I I'm in charge finally. I'm getting the remote. So, you know, there's there's times when you get old enough, your faculties are not uh, as cohesive as they should be. I, I can't explain it. I mean, he wasn't like this publicly 20 years ago, was he? Pope Francis was kind of muddle in the middle, but he wasn't... Uh, uh, well, people are saying it's because the people with whom he has surrounded himself. Yes. Uh, they're trying to basically... they. Francis's time is coming to an end, so they're trying to basically ensure a successor is appointed, is elected by the uh, cardinals in the conclave that will carry on the reforms of the liberal reforms. Uh, evidently, there's a story, there was a group of bishops who met in St. Galen, Switzerland, before the last election, who basically got together and the liberals say, this is how we're going to get our man elected. And these things are, are said to be happening again. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 830 of Anglican On Screen.